Okay, welcome, welcome to to the fifth lecture on deep learning for NLP. And just making sure that this is working. So this is the case. Okay, cool. Um, happy to see you again. Um, just a few feedbacks I I got from last uh, last lecture. So thanks a lot for the feedback, by the way. And so there is an interesting mixture of feedback on the on the pace of these lectures. Some people saying it's too slow and some saying it's too too fast. So <laughs> I'm afraid the truth is maybe somewhere in the middle and it really depends on what you already know and you don't know. So yeah, so if you, unfortunately you cannot skip it or fast forward here. So just be patient and try to keep up. And if it's too fast, then I would suggest to just go to YouTube then and watch the lecture again, maybe, and go you know, on your own pace. And if you have any questions, just, so this is like the first feedback. I hope it will make everybody, uh, well, not happy, but at least a little bit happy. And the question was about the Übung, uh, the Übungen, so the, the exercises and the homeworks, if you if you can get any, any advice or any help on that. Yes, absolutely. So there's contacts for the tutors on the Moodle, or you just, you know, you can DM them on the um, on Discord or get in touch with them. And there could be, on demand consultations with them if you want. So feel free to, to approach the tutors and, and feel free to address them with any question you might have. Great, okay, so today's lecture is entitled Text Generation, Language Models and Word Embedding. So we are so far considering text classification and now we're moving to text generation, but the boundary is kind of not really that the chart. Okay, so the story so far was, um, we talked about mm, last time about nonlinearity and uh, multi-layer perceptron in the end, and also some how to embed categorical features. But we're gonna we gonna a little bit spend a, a little bit time on that because I guess it's like really central to uh, deep learning and NLP. So the thing with the nonlinearity non and give you an example why the nonlinearity is central to actually good representation learning. So everybody remembers this. What is what is this? It's a log linear model for, well, this could be like binary classification because we're here, we're outputting, we have a, a, a categorical, sorry, excuse me. We have a, a scalar label here, which is uh, zero one. And we're plugging into the features, into the model, multiplying by weights and bias. And here's some similarity, which could be, for example, sigmoid. Okay, so this is good. And this works well for, cases which are so-called linearly separable. So linear models works for cases, for classification cases where you can separate the your training instances by a line. What it really means, so here's a couple of, I guess, cool um, uh, visualizations coming from the playground TensorFlow. I really recommend go there and, and play around with the data. So just to explain what we're trying to do here. So we have a, we have a task, which is a binary classification and here we see um, the data set which is very small. Here is a bigger one. We, here we see how where the we have two features basically, so two dimensions. So this is the x vector is of dimensionality two, and one feature is this x, and the other feature is on this x. And we see blue and and red dots defined by their feature. So feature value. Here, this is one red dot and it has feature value such and such. And the other class, the blue ones are mostly here. So they have different features, right? Everybody's with me like feature representation. Okay, so they have numerical values, these features. If these were words, they would be maybe like zero or one for binary one not encoding or there could be also real numbers between maybe zero and one. So we have these feature projected in two, two, two dimensional space. And what we're trying to do, sorry. <laughs> What we're trying to do is to separate them, uh, to classify them into, uh, like the learned decision rule, to separate them into blue and and, uh, and um, orange. And after you run this, after training, there's like 176 epochs, which you can run in a browser and it will learn there is a line between these two classes and it achieves like 100% accuracy. So the test loss, they call it the loss. So the, the lower, the better, the test loss is zero. Yeah, so we reach 100% accuracy. Why is this, why we call this linearly separable? So we can draw a line between the two classes. So a line in two dimensions. There is a line which separates two, two, these two classes. So instances from one and the other. 
if we were in the in the three dimensions or more dimensions, it wouldn't be a line. It would be the so-called hyperplane. And hyperplane is always a sort of a plane which is one dimension less than the than the surrounding space. So in three dimensions, hyperplane would be a plane. In four dimensions, hyperplane would be I have no idea what it would be. So some kind of linear function. Okay. But in two dimensions, it's a it's a line. In one dimension, it would be just a dot. If we have uh, examples on one dimension, left and right, we would find a dot, like a one point, which kind of separates these two classes if they are linear separable. Okay, everybody's with me on linear, linear separation. Why is this the case? This is nice. And linear models can tackle that. This is cool. Unfortunately, in reality, most things are not linear separable in the feature space we know. So for example, a task called um, exclusive or, Right, we have the same setup, blue and red dots, but now these blue and red dots kind of occupy different parts of the space. So here we have the, the red dots and here are the blue dots, right? The problem is if you run, okay, and maybe I should say something about this, this thing here. So this is basically a linear model. There is no hidden layer anywhere. So this is just features transformed by, as we have here, this model. So basically the same thing. So we have a features, there's some transformation and bias and, and that's it. And no, uh, this is like a sigmoid. So this is the same thing. X1, X2 features, there's this multiplication implicitly and then we map it to, uh, to the outputs. Unfortunately, linear models, I mean, well, not linear models. I mean, can you, can you draw me a line between these two classes so it separates them with some okay-ish accuracy. Well, there is no way to do, I mean, you can do like that, you get 50%. You can do like that, you get 50%. This would be 50% accuracy. I mean, there is no way to draw a line to get some meaningful accuracy, which is not random, right? Is it clear? Yeah, that's, so that's bad. <laughs> so, okay, so what can we do about it? How can we make this model more expressive? What can we, can we add something to the model? Yes. We can add a function. Okay, that would be cool. Which function and where? Um, for example, some logarithmic functions so instead of a straight line, we have a curve. We can, okay, so you say you can add some little curve somewhere. Yeah. Yes, that might be, but you would have to kind of transform, transform the features in a way. You can do this. You can transform the, the features, but we learned that in deep learning, you will learn a presentation of the feature. So you, you learn some mapping to some other space. So there is something which is much, which could be better suited to, to learn better representation of these features, to map them somewhere else. Yes. So they have no, no linear function? We can add nonlinear function. Okay. Yes. Nonlinearity, I'm with you because obviously <laughs> it is a nonlinear for a reason. Yeah. Yes. We can add more parameters, I would say, or dimensions. All oh, right. Okay. So you're 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 again in the in the feature space. That's fine. That's doable. But we have some maybe we can add it in layers. Exactly. Let's add a layer. Okay. So because a layer is basically a mapping from one space to another space, and maybe in the other space the features will be better, more separable. Okay. So that's a good question. That's a good good approach. So let's do something. We stack hit. We st we add another transformation and another layer. So and this is. We're adding here another linear layer here. So this was our first kind of first model, right? And we're plugging in here another another transformation, another linear map. So we're mapping from the hidden hidden state to to the output space, right? This is what we had last last time. So stacking linear linear layers, and we will see that stacking linear layers is still a linear model. We 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 said it last time, but now we can also demonstrate it exactly. So Basically, there is just two linear transformation, which is in the end, again, a linear transformation. So if you do it here in this kind of playground and we're adding one hidden layer here, but this is still linear. So there is no non-linearity here. It still failed to learn anything meaningful because at the end, it's still trying to find a, find a curve, uh, sorry, find a, find a line. 
So, right, stacking linear layers after each other doesn't save you because it's a linear model. And here we have another proof, like a visual kind of visualization of that. So this is not a good idea. So we need to do one more thing here. And somebody said it, like, uh, who said it? Non-linearity, you, I guess so. So what we need to do to, to plug into here is some non-linearity after, after this layer. And this is the non-linear function here. Oh, sorry, after the, after the first layer. So this is the nonlinear function, which is applied element wise. So we're plugging here some nonlinear transformation of our kind of second projection space. Okay. So what are the typical nonlinear functions? We have last time, I guess, we have ReLU, which is taking a maximum, or it's basically uh, such a function. So it's zero for zero values, and then it's just a linear. So this is ReLU. And another in another one very typical is um, hyperbolic tangent. So it's uh, two exponentiations, and it's basically squashing everything between, I guess, minus one and one, roughly. I guess. Oh, sorry, it should be zero. Okay. So we plug in this function in there, and it's gonna make wonders because then, even if we add a fewer neurons in the hidden layer it will exactly learn this kind of mapping. It will learn that you know the space is now, in the latent space, is kind of now projected into something which is linearly separable. And at the end, in this space, there is a line which kind of distinguish them. And here we mapping back, mapping back to, the, to the original feature space. So in the feature space, we have these kind of weird shapes. And in the hidden layer, it, it's, a, it's a linear function which can kind of distinguish these, these points, the red and blue ones, okay? So we can, with nonlinear function and one hidden layer, we can solve the ex, you know exclusive for problem, for, exa for example. Any questions? Well, I have one. So where do you, where do you see um, where would you find a XOR function in NLP classification? Like XAR, like. Either or those. Will you find some example of that where this is a real issue in, let's say, classification with words? Yeah, and how exactly in sentiment analysis? Do you have any idea? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Yes. That's. Um, but I think you're taking a different angle because we're talking about the features, like where 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 you find the features that have, have these properties. Like both of them either true or both of them either false, and not the other way around. Any idea? Sentiment of negatives. You're close. Okay. So I guess this could be an example. So we have here. Basically, vocabulary, only three words, okay? So I'm not laughing, it's not a real, real word example, but it might happen. So we have just three words in our vocabulary, and the words are not, bad, and good. And the features are binary. So either we have the, the feature is there in the text as one, and, or the feature is not there as zero. And I visualize here as a three dimension. So here basically is dimension of good. So here is zero. So the good is not there, and good is there. And here, the bet is there and not, and here not is there and here's nothing, right? So we have three features and there are several interesting combinations. So for example, here, so can you kind of visualize this 3D space? In here, we have a combination of not good because the bet feature is zero here. So we have not good. And here we have combination of not is one and bet is one, which kind of corresponds to not bet, right? So, and if you just project this on a plane, so I try to try to, in, uh, to to draw a plane here, which is this projection. So this blue thing is this projection. We would have this x error problem because we have in this area instances which have good and not bad, which kind of corresponds to the positive sentiment, right? And here we have bad and not good, which kind of corresponds to the negative sentiment of the labels. How can you draw a line here? Well, you can't, so that's the point. So that's one potential example of having 
this exclusive or in the feature space for text classification. And obviously we need to solve with some nonlinearity, which would be uh, MLP with nonlinear function in between. Okay, any questions? Good, okay, so let's move on. So this was like a recap from last time, but I want to really stress, you know, the nonlinearity and the linearity, how, how important concept that is. If you stack linear layers, that's uh, that's not gonna solve, solve your problem. The second thing we had last time was the embeddings of categorical features, and we're gonna spend some time on this today as well. So just to recap, we have these learn, so we are doing, what was that? Uh, language identification, right? Uh, six different categories and the vocabulary. And we said that this, this matrix W is a learned representation. And each row, basically in this learned representation of the matrix corresponds to a, a particular word, a unigram. And it gives us some dense representation of this word because on this original feature space, these are just one hot encodings. And by this projection, we are projecting them into something which is not that big. So how, how big could be the, okay, how big is the vocabulary typically again? Yes, 10,000, 50,000, 70,000, right. So we are compressing a 70,000 one hot encoding into six dimensional vector. So it has different properties, but it's dense representation. And it might have nice properties that maybe two words are kind of similar in this latent space. So basically here, in so this is our multi-layer perceptron. So this is the first layer. And then this is the second layer. And here after this first layer, we have this uh, nonlinear and fun nonlinear function, and in and the first layer, this W one, this learns representation embeddings of the categorical features index. So we had it last time, and it's going to be a topic today and in the next lecture as well. So learning representation, this is a key part of deep learning and learning good representations. So whatever you do at the end, be it classification or a generation, it's not. It's always like classification or uh, probability so probability distribution prediction it's nicely separable. Great, so today we're moving into, oh, sorry, sorry, any question to, to this part? All right, so we're moving to language models and also word embeddings a little bit. And we start with the, with the language models. Um, and for language models, you unfortunately or fortunately need some probability, uh, this you know, probability theory a little bit. And I guess it's never it's never too late to refresh a little bit of probability theory. So let's let's uh, jump onto that and have it done. So who? Okay, uh, a quick poll: Who hates probability theory? Fair enough. Who loves probability theory? Okay. So okay, I'm not going to ask you a lot, but why do you hate it? No, serious. That's a serious question. Like, what what makes you kind of feel awkward about probability theory? Any ideas? I'm, I'm really curious. It's not very intuitive. Okay, that's true. Any other? Why don't why people hate probability theory? Everybody uses different notation. Everybody's using different notation. Yes, yes. Any yes, I second that. Any anything else? I failed an exam. <laughs> you fail an exam. Oh man, I failed so many exams, and you know. That doesn't, yes, but there was a reason why you failed, right? Anyway, any, so last opinion on why probability theory is kind of not a, not the nicest course, anything, except of yours, yeah, before. Okay, you can think about it and, you know, at the evening thing, you're like, well, maybe it's not that bad, but I, I completely second the part, like everybody's using different notations and this is exactly, if so, because if you do like high school probability theory, you have all these like all oh, random variables and then you go statistics and you have like, oh, everything is Gaussian and it's, you know, and then you go to machine learning like it's like everything is, you know, categorical random variables or there's there's no even random variables, they're just probably the distributions and they call it like, oh, what is this? And then you have like really hardcore, uh, I would say, measure theory kind of uh, mathematicians saying like, well, everything's integral and expectations anyway. So. And you feel like, like these are different worlds, they're the same thing, but everybody's using different kind of notations and stuff like that. So that's why I think it's also important to kind of, you know, have a refresher here on the, on the um, notations we're gonna be using. 
So we have categorical random variables. We had it already before, like different categories and there's, there's no ordering whatsoever. So maybe a categorical random variable is something which we observe as random and want to, you know, want to reason about the probabilities of these things. So the first word in a sentence, for example, we call it capital letter and W1, for example. So now, you know, we're using notation. Well, it's not a matrix, it's a random variable. Oh, that sucks. Okay, so just, you know, be aware it's coming from a different kind of world a little bit. So we have the first random variable and this could be one of those uh, words from the vocabulary. Okay, it's random, but we have a probability distribution over these random variables. And the probability distribution is saying, well, okay, what is the actual outcome of this event uh, of this random variable and you know what is this probability and the probability is something between zero and one okay so for example what is the outcome that the first word is equals to d and we have some it has some probability and we put basically probability distribution we distribute the overall probability of one to each of these categories over the vocabulary okay everybody's with me there is one property we need to take into account this is everything sums up, sums up to one Right, so if you kind of estimate these probabilities, it has to sum up to one. So far, so good. And then comes the notation. So we're using different notations and you will see. So this, this PR is actually very nice in LaTeX. So you just write PR and it renders this thing. But people are using also, and here we're saying, okay, the, the random variable, variable equals to some, some outcome. So there's a value. People are also using just PW1 or just P of the word and so on. And this can get very confusing and messy. And, you just you know misuse notation, so be aware of that. You know, eventually there is a random variable taking some of these values of the categories. Any questions so far, or any suggestions? Are we doing something which you don't, which you never seen? Not sure, but the data isn't like independently distributed, right? Because the data isn't independently distributed. We we are not there even. Like we're saying there is a there is a one random variable. And we say, for example, this is the first word. And the event would be, okay, well, I have a pack of first, okay, here, I don't have a pack. Okay, here, here's the first words, you know, of the sentence, and I'm gonna grab one. And it's the word the, that's it, that's what we're doing. We have, we don't have a second word, we have nothing like that. We're just saying, oh, there's a random variable. Okay? Yeah. There's no, not, no independence whatsoever so far. Okay, any other question? Good, so then we have a notion of joint probability distribution. And this could be, for example, probability of um, the word D at position one and the cat at position two. And basically <laughs> it's, it's uh, again, um, we're using this, this, oh, I'm sorry, where's my, here. We're using this, um, this notation because eventually probabilities or events are set and everything comes to set theory. So there's this a set intersection, but people are using comma as well. And we're basically saying, okay, I'm, I know I'm grabbing here. What is the probability? The first word V and you know, second word is cat. And you know, you multiply them together if they're independent or don't if they're, if they are not, because they are not. But anyway, so this is like joint probability. And we also see, say, we also see the, the notation like with comma. And since there is no distinction between you know, what comes first, because these are sets and there's no ordering, we can also write, write the same, like start with W2 and W1 and then W1. So these are equivalent because there is no ordering of these uh, of these events. Well, sorry, random variables. Everybody's with me? Okay, good. Then we have conditional probability. And this is, um, Basically, definition of that. So, for example, a probability of cat at position two, given that we saw d at position one, and we're using this pipe here. So, w is something, w one, w two is something, and w one is what we've observed, kind of, and we kind of uh, divide these two probabilities. So, the joint divided by the uh, observed variable. Any questions? Conditional probability? Yes. So we're conditioning, okay, so if I saw something already, you know, I, there is something uh, I've experienced already. So I'm thinking based on this information I got from this observation, what is, what is the probability of the next event? So if I, saw, if I saw D at the position one, it kind of 
changes the probabilities of the next word. Because if I saw, for example, I at position one, then the next word will be probably, most probably M or will and so on, right? If I, if I saw, I have a sentence and the first, the first word is I, then the probability of the second word would be maybe higher for M and then will and do and so on, right? I mean, this is, this makes sense. After I typically comes something from these words, while when the first word was D, then the second word will be most likely, I don't know, something else unknown. The man, the cat, and so on. But none of those, because the M is very unlikely. And then I'm thinking, what's the probability of the next word given the first word? Okay, good. Any other questions? I hope that's not the reason why you hate probability theory. <laughs> but okay, so one last slide and we threw it, okay? So then we have independence of random variables and then two random variables are independent if and only if their joint probability is the, uh, is the product of their, of their probabilities. I don't know if we're actually gonna use it here, but it's important to know like what, okay, independent random variables, you have to know that. And then we have also conditional independence where two random variables x, y are conditionally independent given something observed, if and only if their kind of joint condition is product of these conditional probabilities. Maybe you don't need this one at all, but independent random variables you should kind of know and remember because they are they just they are over all over the place. Yes. And that's correct. Yeah, and here as well. Yep, why? Yeah, thank you. Now this is correct. Anything else which is bad on these slides? <laughs> okay, good. Nobody noticed. This is really because I used it already once and I was like, of course. So they didn't pay attention. Good, you do. All right, so this will like probability refresher and this is all you need. Now let's move to language models. And we start with something which is called classical language models for a reason because language models mean different things nowadays, but at the end of the day, they mean the same thing as well. So what is language models and why do we care about it? So the goal of language modeling is to assign a probability to sentences or sequences of words in language. So for example, we might ask, what is the probability of seeing the sentence, the lazy dog bark loudly? Why do we want to? Why do we want to know this? Like, why? I, why do we care about the probability of a sentence in language in the first place? Is it of any use? Maybe I'll give you another example, and then you know I'll let you think about it. Also, we want the language model to assign a probability of a given word or a sequence of words to follow the sequence of words, right? So, for example, what is the probability of seeing the word bark after seeing? after seeing the sequence, the lazy dog. So we have the lazy dog and the next word would be, oh, bark or maybe something else. So what is the probability of, of bark? So now why this is interesting at all? Outer uh, complete on phones, for example, right? Because every time you type something and it gives you like the next sentence, next word, and you just type the next word, the next word, the next word. And they're also sorted, I guess, right? I mean, you have like the most likely and second most likely and so on. Any other idea why why language model might be good? Yeah, if you're generating text, you wanna you wanna prefer sentences which are more likely in the language. Yeah, that's correct. It's kind of the same with the um with the uh, suggestion for typing but you have to do it like manual and if you're generating text we come to that later you can use it definitely yes uh, oh this is interesting okay for text classification the sentences which are more less likely are more important huh okay 
that's interesting. Uh, yeah, that, that could work. I mean, you can use the probability to infer something about the training data, and then you might want to maybe filter your training data based on their probability. So filter out the common examples having and having some outliers in your model, maybe. I didn't see that, that much, but it's, yeah, why not? Okay, cool. Maybe for the text comprehension, then uh, uh, set uh, sentence is given and the word was not understandable uh -huh. because it was uh, uh, pronounced poorly mm -hmm. because it was just written falsely. Okay, yeah. Get what is the most likely words after the deformation. Yeah, exactly. And if you put it a little bit farther, you can use it basically for speech recognition. And it's basically where it, it has been used for decades in speech recognition. Because typically, now it's everything is like one model and never, but, but before that, you had like transferring, I'll get you, transferring from acoustic signal to some set of phonemes or some subword units. And then you want to reason about like what is the most likely sentence in this language given these set of phonemes. And then you have to rank your predictions based on their probability in the language. And the language model would give you like the rank of the probabilities. Yeah. Word similarity? But you need probabilities of sequences for that. I don't know. I mean, it makes sense what you're saying, but I'm thinking like whether you need language model to kind of assess that. Okay, any other, any other point? Language models for POS tagging? Sure, yeah, you can, yeah, so like you have uh, transition probabilities between words and multiply by the talks and your hidden Markov model stuff. Okay, yeah, this is not really like language models, but because language models is basically just a sequence of words, but the ideas from language models are kind of similar to hidden Markov models. Yeah, it's correct. Another one I saw, yes. Sorry, say, can, can you speak louder? Sorry. Grammatical structures? Yeah, maybe, yes. You can reason about like similar structures in terms of their probabilities in the language. That's correct. Okay, yeah, so very good. Uh, language models is a thing. Basically, nowadays, what you see in ChatGPT and all these models, this is basically a language model. It's not a language model in the classical sense, but it's just doing predict the next word thing. <clears throat> Given the context, just give me what's the next word. And you have a probability of the next word, and you pick maybe the most likely one and generate the next text. This is basically the same kind of underlying idea of, of language modeling. That's why also like these transformer models are also, also like, uh, called large language models or language models, because they don't give you necessarily the probability of the, of the segment, but they give you probability distribution over the next word, maybe, or generate the top next word, okay? So that's why language model is really central to NLP. And then uh, let's have a look like a formal definition. So we have a sequence of words and I'm using um, a small w and this is a sequence one to n, which is just a concatenation of word w1, w2, and so on. So we want to estimate the probability of, um, of the sequence, which is now, and now we're kind of misusing notation because it's a, it's a joint probability of word at position one, at certain word of position two, and so on. So we're sloppy in notation. We should kind of write this really precisely. So what is the joint probability that the given word is at position one, the given word is, sorry, this should be W2, the given word is position two, and so on, so on, so on. So like joint kind of probability distribution, all, all these random variables where each random variable means what is the position, what is the word at certain position, okay? So typically when we have this large joint probability, we typically factorize it into, uh, into a product. And here we are using very nice factorization which is left to right factorization. So what we're gonna do is that in order to 
you know, write these, this joint probability. So, so this, this has a name, basically. Factorization has a name. And it's called also the chain rule, but not the chain rule as we know, but the chain rule of probability, OK? So you can factorize the joint probability distribution into a factor of conditional probabilities. And it comes from the definition of uh, conditional probability. So here we're saying um, the, the probability distribution of the whole sequence is a product of these conditional probabilities. And here we're starting with something very awkward. We're starting with what's the probability of given word one, given this symbol S. And this symbol S is just a starting symbol of the sequence. So we're saying, okay, given the starting symbol of the sequence, what's the probability of word one? Then multiply by, okay, what's the probability of word two given the start and first word? What's the probability of word three given the start, word one and word two, and so on and so on, okay? So this is one way, how when can we factorize this large joint distribution? Why this is, in, why this is useful? Why are we factorizing from left to right? Exactly. We only need the words we've seen before, and there's something special about language. We write left to right, and we also think left to right, speak left to right, because for everything you need to know so far, you've heard it before, because you don't have to look in the future, because you don't see the future, mostly. Right? So this is interesting, because the language is kind of like left to right think in writing mostly and also in, in, in conceptual thinking. Good, so this is great, but is there, any, is there any catch here? So this is nice factorization, but still maybe is it, I mean, are we getting any better than, than just this up here? Is this any better in terms of complexity or you know model size or whatever we want? Is there any, is there any catch? I mean, we can factorize this thing, but did it help us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can compute the probability of the whole sen sentence, but okay, but maybe, yes, you're right. Yes. When working very specific probabilities, like you only could generate like a specific or like a specific core. Not, not really. No, I, I'm, I'm, I don't think, I don't think so. I, I don't know. Maybe I don't understand your, your what you're saying. Is you train for okay, like the the last mm -hmm. the last yes the last of text mm -hmm. like yeah. on everything that came before would like. There probably wouldn't be a vector in there that would exactly yeah exactly so this is this is basically too big to make some good estimates of any probability because you would have to seen this sequence before in order to estimate the probability of the next token right was it what you were trying to say yeah exactly at some point the probabilities will be zero okay so this is this is the part i mean Basically, we turn the problem of n random variables into the problem of n minus one random variables. So it's not of much use. I mean, this is awful. Why is it awful? Well, because of the complexity and we get to that and the zero probabilities as well. Yeah, that's a good point. So we need to make some simplification. And the simplification will be, because here we're still depending on the all previous words. You know, if you have sentence of like 40 tokens, you still need all of them to factor in, which, you need in order to understand language, you need a long kind of dependencies. For example, in books, how the depend I know in books, the dependencies are quite long because in one chapter there's introduction of a person, you know, there's a name, and 60 pages later, you have to remember the name. Kind of in order to, you know, make the make the distance and understand. Well, we're gonna simplify it in classical language models. Because you know, despite factorization, this is the issue. The last term is still depends on all the previous words of the sequence. So we're going to make a so-called Markov assumption, kth order Markov assumption. And I'm, you might have seen Markov assumption in many other contexts. 
we're only saying that the next word depends only on the last k words, right? So we're saying, well, okay, this probability of the ith word doesn't depend on all the previous words. It only depends on the, the previous and the k previous words. So I'll show you an example in this slide. So for example, if we have, we have the sentence, so the starting ball, the cat set on the, and then we want to model probability of the, of the token W6. We're position six and we have second order mark of assumption. Then we're gonna turn the whole joint or condition probability uh, based on, depending on the whole sentence into basically probability of this sentence given the previous two. Right, so we only take the two previous two previous uh, tokens to depend on. So this is a simplification, right? I mean, why should it work? Exactly, it, yeah, that's a great. Point. Can I? Can, can I? Uh, okay, I'm gonna quote you. What did you say? It 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 doesn't kind it kind of works, but it doesn't really work. Yeah, that's true. It kind of works, but obviously, if you just cut the context, it doesn't really work. But it mostly works. Yeah, that's the that's the that's the goal. So it works for many reasons. So the k k order would be something between I don't know, like two, three, four, four maximum, right? So four orders. Uh, so four. So we call it also n-gram. So n-gram language model. So two gram bigram language model or trigram language model. Uh, it works surprisingly good, although we kind of ignore the whole long dependency stuff, right? So because also in language, mostly we kind of work locally most of the time. So it works, and obviously it will fail for reasons where you need long long range dependencies. Okay, it will work also like computationally because how can we estimate these probabilities? Okay, well, this is the point. Like probability, well, you know, these are how can we how do we know the probabilities? How can we learn them? This is an interesting question. So, how do we learn the probabilities? How can we estimate the probabilities of the, for example, let me say, how do we find the probability of, of this? We're counting, yes, exactly. We're counting and there's another very, very fancy operation, counting and dividing. Yes, we're counting and dividing, exactly. So it has a fancy name. Do you know the fancy name for that? It's called maximum likelihood estimation. <laughs> Basically counting and dividing. So in order to estimate the pro this conditional probability of, uh, of word at position i, given the previous context, we're looking at the sequence of the, of the, whole, of the whole sequence and on the, the number of occurrences. So this is number of occurrences. Uh, and divided by the number of occurrences without the last word. And that's it. That's how we estimate the probabilities. So, sounds easy. Is it easy? It's super easy, actually. I mean, you can really implement it, just go through the corpus and counting and dividing. This is really cool. But then the question is, as you mentioned before, what if we hit zero? So there is no occurrence of, of the denominator. Domin what happens? Dividing by zero, bad thing. So what can we do? Because it might be we just don't see a a certain, I mean, the longer the the, the engrams go, the less chance we have that we kind of encounter it in the training data. But maybe it's a valid, I'll get you, it's a valid sequence. It's a valid sequence, but we just don't have it in our training data. Because maybe there's like, there is a, I don't know, there could be a, what could be there? A name, like a surname. Yeah, so there's a sequence like uh, Angela Merkel went home. Sorry for this example, I don't have any better. Uh, Angela Müller, okay, there is a sequence, Angela Müller went home, and your model never saw this foreground, but it saw like Angela Merkel went home like a thousand times or something like that, right? But you have a zero occurrence here. So what can we do about it? Somebody was, sorry, go ahead. Ed one. 
Why why would you do that? You had machine learning before, right? Or yeah, okay. So how okay, so what's the name of what you're just, just saying? Yeah, there is even more if there is a, a even cooler name for that. You I trust you. I mean come on, what was the name of that? Uh, you would use it, yeah. It's ML, ML it's yeah. There's this a different concept, but for this smoothing, this is smoothing. It's correct. It's it's also something else. Okay, good. I got you. It's a Laplace smoothing, and it's it's also it basically gives you prior in your quality model. So you have prior, and this MLE is kind of posterior, and you would kind of get like fake counts in your model. What could be the priors? Dirichlet's, yeah. Sorry for dating this to. I mean, I was just, I was just checking you. Sorry about it. But yes, you, you're right. What you're doing is that. Well, we don't, we don't need, we don't need a zero. We don't like the zeros, so we say, okay, let's add some fake number, maybe one or maybe something smaller. But the one is typically the 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 value of choice. So add one smoothing, and we just you know, at plus plus one here and here we multiply by the number of words in the vocabulary. So it's kind of saying we're kind of faking observed data, but it gives us no zero probability. So then basically our model can give us probability for any sequence we encounter. Okay. Smoothing. Any questions? Good. So how can we evaluate language models? That's a good question. So we have a language model. Again, what is a language model? What is it? It's uh, it's saying us what is the probability of a sequence. Yeah. So so what? I mean, how can we evaluate language models? So let's say I give you I give you two language models, and tell me which one is the better. Sorry, louder. Like easy solution was to. Sit down to people and say which one feels more natural. Sit, sit two people and say which one feels better. But the model is just a table with parameters of probabilities. Like let it generate. Let it generate and and tells which one feels better. Yeah. But what if they generate different texts? <laughs> do you volunteer to do this evaluation? I mean, it's it would take a lot of time, right? But okay, this this is fair. I mean, human evaluation is always an option. Can we can we do something else than a human evaluation? Um, we like if we let the model generate text, then we could compare occurrences of words in that text to actually naturally written text. You, you let generate the model of text, and you would compare the what is generated to other texts. Yeah, like letter occurrences, word occurrences, things like that. Yeah, I think you can do that as well. Yeah, that 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 give you something. Yes. So, uh, uh, for example, sentences or text were missing um, and as an output it has to predict the missing words, and the one with the most uh, accurate score. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You're getting summary. So you're saying you keep some test data. And you will measure something like accuracy on the test data. Okay, yeah, that's that's a, that's a good approach. We can do something even simpler, I would say, and um, we can we can split a data set into. So there's a there's a fancy word for evaluating language models called perplexity. But basically, we let's have like n sentences in a test corpus. So we have training corpus, and you know the you learn the probabilities, um, and then we have test corpus. Of n sentences, and each of them has a uniform probability appearing one over n. Okay, so this is we have a sentences, and they are uniformly distributed in our test corpus. So this is one kind of assumption. Then, if you remember from last lecture, the cross entropy. If you don't, this is a formula for cross entropy. So it's a it's a logarithm of our one over probability from our model times the probability of the truth. So the truth here is the one over n. Right, so this is this one, and the logarithm is one over the probability of this sentence 
assigned from the language model. Okay, so this is what the language model is saying is the probability of our sentence. And we're iterating, we're summing up all these, uh, all these sentences. So again, we have n sentences in train data, and we go through all of them and compute for each of the sentence the probability of the sentence by the language model, right? Makes sense, right? The language model is trained and should give our sentences, which are real sentences, high probabilities. So what is the maximum? What is the maximum here we can achieve of this probability of a sentence? Theoretically, what's the maximum probability? It's one. Yeah, well, we won't get one because we would have only language with one sentence only, which is always probable. So it's not the case. It will be less than one, right? Which means, okay, so here, here's a question. So this might be maximum one, but what could be the logarithm of this thing? What could, is, does it have any minimum or maximum? Yeah, so the, the minimum of this logarithm would be zero if this were like the maximum probability. It won't be always maximum probability, it'll be something, so it's bounded from, from below. Oh, which means the whole thing, the lower the better. Because we want our model to say, yeah, this sentence is probable in this in this language. It has some probability. It has non-zero probability. And the higher the probability of the sentence, because it's a real sentence, the better. Right? So this is how we are kind of evaluating the model. Or we're comparing two models. And the one if one model is saying, well, this sentence is actually pretty probable for this language, then it's better than the other saying, like, oh no, no, this sorry, this is not a sentence of this language. Why? Because these sentences are actually a real sentences from the language because it's they are in the, our test corpus. So everybody's with me so far? Great. We're going to do a little bit arithmetic operations here. So what we're going to do is to plug the 1 over n before the sum. And the rest is remaining. And the next, what we can do is just get rid of this ugly fraction in this logarithm. So what is the logarithm of 1 over something? Not you, not you. I know, no, I know you know. Okay, so what is this? It's a negative, yes. Okay, so we, we have this negative. Eh, we've seen this before. This is the cross entropy. Yeah, this is what you had last time. This is the cross entropy we had last time. Basically nothing new. And then we turn it into perplexity as the power of two. So two power cross entropy is basically perplexity of language model. So if you typically you see this in a textbook and say, ah, oh, this is ugly formal after numbers. Oh, two power, blah, 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 blah. No, it has a meaning. It's just a cross entropy and it's two power. Okay? Yes. Two to the power? No, there's a there's a meaning which I forget exactly. So there's a meaning why two to the power, it tells you exactly um how many different words kind of I'm not, I'm not sure. I have to double check that, but there's a meaning why you, you can use basically a cross entropy, but the perplexity has a meaning in the in the count of the different words which you kind of expect on each position. Something like that, but I'm not 100 percent sure. But it has a meaning like interpretation wise. Any questions? Yes. We need to test for wrong sentences as well, because that would just require very liberal language. Yeah, wrong sentences, how you test for wrong sentences. So we have to create wrong sentences. Yes. The same. Yeah, you typically do. Uh, typically, you don't. You don't do that. Because you take because for training this language model for counting and dividing, what you need? Do you need any training data? So, what's the training data? What's the training data for training this language model? So again, counting, dividing. Let me let me come here. What do you need for this? A lot of sentences. Yes. Do you need anything else? So compared to, for example, sentiment analysis or machine translation, what do you need for this? So do you need any labels? No. Do you need anything else except for a raw text? No. We just need a raw text. This is great. We just take a plain text and counting and cut it into chunks and then counting and dividing. That's all we need. We basically, we don't, we don't need any human intervention here. We just take a text as it's written and we're counting and dividing and learning a language model. This is great. So then we also take it for 
you know, we take another part of the corpus, which is kind of just a free text, like news bar, whatever you find on the internet, and, and run it on there. So we, we don't really corrupt the sentences or the language model. At least it's not typical. Maybe somebody's doing that, I don't know. Okay. Okay, great. So we have language models. Um, they're great. So we have these, these are the ngram classical language models, counting and dividing probabilities. Um, what are the shortcomings? Okay, shortcomings of ngram language models, we have one already, so I'm, I'm gonna reveal it right away. So all these long range dependencies, we need to see a, so for, for example, to capture a dependency between the, uh, the next word and the word 10 positions back, we need to see a relevant uh, 11 gram in the text. So we need to see the exact same sequence of 11 tokens, which you will rarely see. Why? Because just it's just extreme. Because you need, you know, if you have 7,000, sorry, sorry 50,000 huge vocabulary. So we have 50,000 um, positions or 50,000 options at first uh, times 50,000 in the second word times 50,000 in the third word times 50,000 in the fifth word and so on. So it's basically exploding, like the space of possibilities is just endless. So to see a particular 11 gram, it's like almost impossible, super unlikely. So yeah, that's, if you need to model this, we're kind of, we're screwed. So this is one thing. Another is, um, it's kind of like lack of generalization across context. So for example, if you observed during training black car, and blue car, it does not influence our estimates of the event red car if we haven't seen it before, right? So it doesn't generalize our own context. It, there's no, these are just categorical kind of things and they have no notion of similarity. So they don't help us in estimating other things that are related, okay? Great, so we're moving on and what could be better than counting-based language models will be their language models, obviously. So what we want to do is again the same thing. We given a previous context, previous words, we're gonna get a probability distribution over the next next word. We want to find which what are the probabilities of each word from the vocabulary for the next word given the previous ones. Okay, so we can build a neural network for this, right? Why not? So the input will be the k-gram of the of the context, so the words w1 to k, and the output is the probability distribution over the vocabulary v for the next word wk plus one. Okay, everybody's with me on it. This is kind of crucial, so I'll I'll give you some time to think about it. Any questions? Yes. It doesn't have to do anything with the weights in the network at all. It's just saying if I have the output of the of the network, so this is there is a network, and there's coming a a vector of size of the of the vocabulary. And I'm gonna put probabilities for each of them. Right? And they all sum up to one. That's it. And this is just what I'm predicting, basically. In general, we're we're not. Yeah, well, it is it is kind of conditional probability. You're right. It it is kind of conditional probability. I want our model to con to pro to make this like probability of k plus one given we to k. Yes, that's what I want our model to do. How the model is doing that? It's our my decision. I can train engrams by counting and dividing, or I can say, well, let's build something more complicated like neural network, as long as it takes the input and produces the output. It's kind of like interface. And I'm changing implementations, like one is engram and one is neural. Eventually, all of them in, you know, produce this kind of uh, distribution over the vocabulary, okay?
for the labels, we just we just we just do as we did before. We just cut uh, a part of of the data and saying, well, up until here, sorry, from your perspective, so left to right. So up until here, this is the context and this is the label. I'll come to that later, how to train it, okay? Any other question? Okay, great. So we're gonna build a neural network. So then there will be some in interesting thing in the network. And this is like, I, I wanna spend again, like two slides on them. This is the embeddings, embedding layer. So we talked last about it last time and today as well. And I'm gonna show um, a clear example of that, hopefully. So our input are categorical features, right? Because we have words and we represent them with uh, one not encoding. So there are categorical features and just zeros and there's one and there's zeros and there's one and they have no notion of distance and so on. So for example, words from a closed vocabulary. It is very common to associate each possible feature. So each word in the vocabulary with a di-dimensional vector for some dimension. So maybe, I don't know, maybe in 50 dimensions or hundred or even thousand, but something smaller than the vocabulary because the vocabulary size is typically bigger than 50,000 words, roughly. And what we're gonna do is wanna, we're gonna take these, these vectors for each word. So each word is associated with a vector, right? And these vectors are also parameters of the model. And we can train these parameters jointly with other parameters. So basically we stitch these vector embeddings of words into the network and they will be trained as any other parameter. And then how can we map this um, symbolic feature values, for example, word number 48 to d-dimensional vectors. This is basically by performing a, a lookup layer or an embedding layer, lookup layer. So, so the parameters in this embedding layer are the matrix uh, W, which is the size of the vocabulary times the dimensions of these of the embeddings. So for example, this would be a matrix W and here, this is the size of the vocabulary. And this is uh, the dimensionality of the, of the embeddings. And then we're saying, uh, for example, so the indexing is for, for word at position 48. I'm just gonna slice here at position 48. I'm just gonna take this row. And this is my representation of the word at position 48, which might be a word cat, for example. And I'm using this kind of slice by picking up from this um, from this matrix. So everybody's fine with this notation, like this is slicing in, in Python or in NumPy. Everybody is familiar with that. I'm saying this row and all the columns, okay? And also we had before, if the symbolic feature is the encoded as one hot vector, the lookup operation can be implemented as size as the multiplication X times E. Oh, sorry, this is not matrix W, it should be E, but anyway, W or E. So it's the same thing, okay? So the matrix, this is one matrix, so, so E. And if I have one hot vector, uh, how does it work? So I have one hot vector here, this would be the word. And at position 48, there is one. So if I multiply this with this matrix, what I'm gonna get is the 48th row, right? It's a lookup operation by multiplication. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So what if, so okay, embedding layer, how does it look in the, you know, in the model we had before? So let's, let's make it very explicit here. So, so far, you know, before we had this thing, so, this was our multi-layer perceptron, right? Everybody's with me. So input features, first layer, then second layer and output, or this would be like the hidden layer and output layer and the loss and the examples. Okay, so this is, we've seen this before. So now what we're gonna add is a couple of operations. So for example, this is a network which takes three words and the embedding size is 50. So here I'm, I'm having three inputs and the examples here are the black dog. And for each of the words, I'm gonna look it up in the embedding matrix. So the lookup operation is basically what he had on the previous slide. So it's the multiplication, multiplication or just picking up the row of the matrix or multiplying by the one of the vector. So from this matrix set of parameters, I'm gonna look up the embedding for, for the word V so the output will be a vector of size 
50, right? Because I have uh, 50 is the dimensionality of embeddings. I'm going to do the same thing for the black. So I have another vector here of size 50. In the dog, I have another size of 50. And I'm going to concatenate them together. So concatenation, what was that again? So I'm basically stacking them after each other. So making this one vector of size 150. So this is the output of the concat. Okay. And then what I'm the only thing I'm doing just putting two in this multilayer percentron, nothing else. I'm just I created basically from three words concatenated embeddings of three of them. Any questions? Oh, a lot of that's great. So this is important. Uh, first, second, third. Okay, start. Um, in this picture, is W also the same than E? No, no. no. So the no in this picture, no. Okay, so here kind of here W was kind of a generic parameters, and the E was the embedding matrix, right? So this could have been also E here. This would be better maybe. But here, these are different parameters. So E is a uh, matrix here, and these are weights and biases here. Okay, uh, you are second. Well, you only get the set by converting to uh, real numbers. You get shown that the important ordering on the embeddings. Do you just avoid this by concatenating, or? Um, you're, okay. Here, there's an ordering of these words. So this is the first, yeah, okay, I didn't say that. So this is like word word one word two and word three. So there's an ordering. So if you concatenate them after each other, it naturally makes sense. First word, second word, and third word. Okay, good. And our question was, yes. Yeah, so where the embeddings, so this is an operation. So there's, there's no parameters, but the parameters is the matrix E. Exactly, where does it come from? That's a great question. So, you can train it. So you start, as any other parameters here, you start with some random initialization and let your model do, I mean, this model is done, we don't know what the model is, model is doing, but it will be doing something and through back propagation, you will learn some embeddings as well. Yeah, so this is the idea, exactly. Yes. Like the dimension of the embedding, it's okay. So it's black magic, black magic in terms of like hyperparameter. So there and there is, I don't. It's like empirical kind of constant you set up. It's like learning rate or number of hidden layers or so. So you say like embeddings should. So the, the standard embeddings from, for example, word to vec, which we'll be talking later on, is three hundred dimensions. Yeah, why exactly three hundred dimensions? Why not two hundred fifty six? It'd be much cooler, you know. So there is no clear, you know clear uh, value of that. Yes. Uh, when, I mean, it's, about, it's some slides to go, but uh, we had we had, we had the, the embedding magnetic with, with the languages. Mm -hmm. but in that one, every column corresponded, corresponded to the language. But exactly. Is, 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 that, is then the embedding dimension one? No, no, no. It was the embedding of not, dimension six. I remember what you mean. Should I go back or, yeah. No. Yeah, but but just the question is: Is it okay? Yeah, the, the embedding dimension was six, mm -hmm. but, but it was six in in the context where each column was, yes. was corresponding to a language. Right. But then how? What is it here? No, no, no. no. I know what it is. Actually, it's just about the, uh, then. Yeah. Uh, if, if if for every column, if there are six columns, and for every column it's a language, then for every language, it's the embedding dimension is one, or is it still stick in in some way? Well, here we take, so we can look at it. So, okay, so there's a mapping from, from words to languages. Yeah. And we say you can look at this matrix from different angles. If you look at it from the columns, then each language is represented as a column in this matrix and it has some properties. So you can maybe cluster languages together. If we look at rows, then each of the, the words has a representation kind of distributed across these languages. And you can also find maybe similar words because they behave similar in the, all these languages, maybe. Yeah. But we here we have like exactly what these columns are. We know exactly, and there are six of them because it was just one layer, one layer linear model. Here, here, 
Here we have 50 dimensions and we have no idea what they mean. They're mapping basically the one of the vector into something which is which is a, uh, a hidden layer representation, which will be again mapped here to something else and then projected to our kind of linear space at the end. Yeah, so for each for each row for the, for the other is is for each for, uh, row uh, zeros all over just for the language and then just a number for for the for the language that that they work. No, no, no. It's some real numbers. Okay, so it's still a six vector. Yes, six yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. exactly. Yes, it's just a real numbers vector, which kind of gives you like the different properties of this word in different languages. Yeah. But here we we are projecting a word into a dimension related to fifty without actually saying what is in these dimensions. We don't say what is there. It should learn something, right? Any other questions? Okay, so I have a question. We said everything has to be differentiable. So how do you differentiate it? What is the partial derivative of Luca or concat? I mean, concat is maybe the easiest. Part of the, part of the network or we can just differentiate it as we, as we do with other layers. Exactly, yeah, you will differentiate, you need like partial derivatives of the function with respect to the to the ch children or, you know, the, the arguments. Yeah, but if this is like x squared, then you know what's derivative. But what is a lookup? What is the partial derivative of lookup? It's kind of tricky because it's not a mathematical function, it's just a kind of Function, yes. You it said that the lookup is x times our embedding matrix, so this is just the correction and yeah. Yeah. differentiating. Exactly. So it's like basically will be one for the for one of the rows and zeros for the other, and that's fine. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. But how do you know, how do you know you will update? What is your okay? What is your L to maybe here, and this would be at position one and three. This is what you need to know in order to update the matrix. At, sorry, sorry, not W, excuse me. Coming back. Uh, matrix E at position two and four. How do you find this partial derivative? Because you need this partial derivative in order to update this, this matrix at E. They also want to update E. Yes, you, you you want to learn it actually. You want to learn these parameters. These are trainable parameters. It's given. Static. Yeah, it, it can be, but you can learn it. And it's maybe better to learn it. If you don't have anything to start with, you want to learn it here, right? So this is like trainable parameter. And then you basically need to find this derivative and it's just basically, you know, using the uh, derivative will be one for the, for the, uh, for the particle input. You had a question. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Okay. Are we good? Sounds great. So, so back to the neural language model. So, okay. So we want to build a um, some prediction of probability distribution over vocabulary for the next word given the previous words. So then we're not going to do some, well, we're going to use kind of some very similar architecture or even like the same architecture as here. Uh, for each word, uh, each input word is associated with the embedding vector through this uh, V function mapping. So it's going to be DW now is word embedding dimensionality. Okay. And we're concatenate for each of the word, we're going to concatenate it in this vector X. So for each in contextual word from one to K, we're just gonna stack them together after each other. So this is basically what we had here, the very same architecture. Okay, and then we have this X vector. So this is uh, you know, the projection of the features, uh, sorry, for the embeddings concatenated after each other. And we're gonna plug it into the um, multi-layer perceptron with one or more hidden layers. And this is exactly the same, same architecture we had before. So we're gonna, Basically, use this as the projection of the of the word through the embeddings. This is the uh, the concatenation, and this is the first hidden layer, and this is the second layer put through the softmax here. And softmax is giving us what? It's giving us probably the distribution of the over the output vector. 
So the output dimension is basically a size of the vocabulary. And basically, this is exact, I mean, in equations, what we had here depicted more or less. So here, this is outputting R to size B vector. And the loss is typically we're going to use, I think I have it here, the loss will be cross entropy loss. I have it on the next slide. So this is the formalization of the of the model we had on the on the depiction. So is everybody fine with that? Sounds good. Okay. So now where to get training examples? Okay, good question. So where did you get training examples for the for the standard classical language model? We just took a corpus and annotated and we just simply do it saying here, like take eng uh, word engrams or ekagrams from from a plain text corpus, like let's let's um, scrape the internet, and we take the first k minus one words and use it as, as these features, and the last word is used as a target label for the classification. So what do we need to kind of specify here is the the vocabulary. So we need to build the vocabulary first because this will kind of determine how many you know. How big the how big the vocabulary is? But basically, what are the units we're kind of trying to learn? And these are typically tokens, but could be also subword units, as we talked about a couple of weeks back. And we train the model using cross entropy loss. Okay, so cross entropy uh, after after uh, so we have softmax, and after that we kind of match one probability distribution predicted by the model. And the true probability distribution, well, the true probability distribution is just basically zeros and one, right? Because we have one hot encoding of the word, the gold standard word. So this is uh, not really probability distribution, it's just one at the position where the, the true word lies. And we are making gross entropy. Any questions? Okay. So let's talk about some advantages and limitations of uh, neural language models. And if you compare it to, to, this, to the classical language models, like the cone based, then when we add more context here, well, if you add context, more context in the, um, uh, in the engram language models, you have to multiply it again by the scale of the, the vocabulary, right? I mean, if you go from, from bigrams to, trigram, to tri trigrams, you have v times v and again times v so 50 times more parameters this is really it's you know exponential growth basically of the parameters while here it roughly goes linearly so if you add more context it's a roughly linear increase in the number of parameters so it's great so you can make a maybe larger context however the size of the output vocabulary affects the computation time right so we have the vocabulary size is 50000 or 70,000, because the softmax at the output layer requires an ex expensive vector vectors multiplication with the matrix, like the number of uh, hidden dimensions times the size of E. So if we had a matrix, okay, hidden dimensions could be, let's say, I don't know, 200. So we had a matrix 200 times 50,000. Oh, that's a, that's a huge matrix. So multipl multiplying this matrix is kind of Quite expensive, yes. Well, here you have to. Here you're in the hidden, the hidden layer, so you have like a full kind of representation, and you you know the vector is kind of full representation, and you have to multiply with the, yeah, with a full matrix basically, because you're projecting to the vocabulary. So you cannot do lookup here because it's not one hot anymore. If I'm come, you know, coming back here, what's coming out of here? So here, it was one hot, one hot, one hot, but since this part you have a, basically a vector. So you have to multiply the vector by the matrix projected. So it's a huge matrix. And then also, if you remember softmax, so what is softmax? How was softmax again? E to, the e to the power of the item divided by, and then, and, and, okay. Exactly. You have to you have to do so it's um E, let me see. X X I over the sum for all I's 
until the size of the vocabulary. Oh, this is awful. Uh, exp, x, i. Maybe this should be j. Okay, so you need to like, if this is 50,000, you need to like 50,000 exponentiation and sum it up. And exponentiation is costly. So that's why this is really, this is really costly. And there are solutions to that. Uh, we don't go into details, but there's like hierarchical softmax or noise contrast estimation. I guess this one will be relevant later on for work to back, but we don't talk about it today. So this is, there are some pros and cons of these neural language models. Okay. Any question or comment? Okay, cool. So we have language models and we can generate text. This is great. And you already mentioned that as an, as an use case. So how can we generate language, generate text with language models? And now it doesn't matter if it's a neural language model or count-based language model because they have the same interface. Like give me probability distribution over the vocabulary for next word given the previous words. So what we're gonna do is that the, when we start, we start with the, obviously with the start symbol, S. And we wanna predict the probability distribution over the vocabulary condition on the start symbol S. So, okay, yeah, what is the probability of word one equals to something given S or equals to something else. And then this will be like size of the vocabulary, right? So this will be like huge probability distribution. And for each word, we have the probability. And then we will, from this probability distribution, we will draw a random word. This will be the first word of the sentence according to the predicted distribution. So how can we draw a, a sample from this kind of categorical distribution? Well, there's something, I mean, you can take like the maximum probability maybe. So, or whatever. You may, yeah, you can take like the maximum probability word. For, why not? Or maybe some others. So you, keep, you pick a word. And then you continue predicate probability distribution of your vocabulary condition on the start symbol and the first symbol. So then you're saying, okay, what is the probability of W2 given W1 and S and so on. And you repeat until you hit a special, another special symbol, the end of sentence. So this is something we need to put into the vocabulary as well, right? Because if we forget a end of sentence symbol, then we will never stop. So something has, it has to terminate somehow. And this will give you pretty decent, I mean, depending on the language model, like even with Engram language model for uh, trigrams, it will give you like plausible sentences, plausible sounding sentences. If you train a super, super large language model, neural language model uh, like uh, GPT-4, it will give you pretty decent sounding sentences. But that's, that's it. You're predicting the next word giving the previous ones. But it's learning quite a lot of things. Okay, any question? Yeah. Uh, how do you condition the model on the first and the second word? For example, don't you have to train a whole new model? You're saying here, this are, like these are relatives. So let me see, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, well, these are relative basically. You're, you don't start, um, you say like the previous, I don't know, like 10 words in a sentence it's my context and that's it. You only take like a limited window. So you don't have to start, well, you have the same model. And if you start, if you're generating the first word, you're kind of, uh, you're kind of putting all the sort of zeros or some padding symbols as the beginning. And then once you progress in the window, you have your generated tokens already. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. It's also called um, autoregressive modeling, autoregressive generation. Okay. Any other question? Where are we? Here. Good. So there's also alternatives to sampling words. So maybe you don't want to take the most probable word at each step, which, well, you, if you do that, like global, it might not be the best kind of sampling strategy. So you might want to do something like beam search, where you basically generate top K candidates at each step. And given these top K, candidates at each step, you generate another top K candidates at each step, and then you take the most probable one. So this is like a standard uh, breadth, breadth first search. And the beam kind of, the beam size determines, you know, how much, uh, how much you need to store in each step. The point is when we do this, um, yes. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, picking random word. I mean, basically, you don't have to. You you can pick random word if you want to be if you want to be random, but you typically pick the most probable one. Where is that? Draw a random word. Yeah, maybe the random. It's not really. Draw, yes, I mean, okay, yeah, uh, conceptually, conceptually, if you draw a random word, it's uh, which is following some sort of distribution, you're most likely hit those which are most more probable, yeah. but you have some randomness, or you can say, I'm just picking uh, really like the most with the most probability, like for sure, <laughs> or you can say, I'm taking like I'm sampling from top K, like top top 10 words, maybe I'm sampling from them determined by the distribution. Yeah, there's different, yes. I mean, this is not really correct as this, you're right. Thanks a lot, yeah. So, and here, when we do this kind of never language model, then, and we update the parameters, so we back propagate back to E, then each row of these E learns a nice word representation. And also each column of W2 here, right? It learns also word representation because W2 is projecting to, to the vocabulary size. So each column here is also, it's something which had in the languages kind of so similar. So the matrix had the uh, six columns and each of them had something about language, but we are now projecting into uh, words again. So each column of this, of this matrix will have something learned about each particular word. And we're gonna use them for Word embeddings. Which brings me to almost to the end of this lecture. Right. So the word embeddings. Um, so option A, we can initialize the embeddings matrix E randomly and learn during our supervised task. Right. So this is what we, we are talking about. Like you can you can learn it from scratch. Or we have some pre-trained word embeddings from some other tasks, from maybe tasks for which we have a lot of data, like language uh, you know language modeling and for example we can use a self-supervised learning so we're create label data for free using the next word prediction objective and we plug our word embedding matrix into our and our supervised task so for example we learn the word embeddings here the e and then we can plug it into another task which is not predicting the next word but maybe uh, predicting sentiment of the sentence but we're using the same learned representation, which are kind of already giving a strong signal about the um, about the words or the embeddings. And the, the embeddings have some features, such as that similar words have similar embedding vectors. And we're gonna learn how to build nice word embeddings uh, with some famous algorithms in the next lecture. Okay, any questions? So takeaways, language modeling is essential part of contemporary natural language processing. So basically everything we see so far, transformers and so on are in, in, in fact, GPT are sort of language models. And they're self-supervised because we create training data for free, just make for prediction. And for this, we need no labels, just unlabeled data. And these narrow language models, as we saw before, they learn embeddings of words, which is super helpful for downstream tasks. Any question? Sorry, yes. Uh, so E E is the uh, E as the metric. It's a word embedding metric. Yes. The Ws are, are not considered as word embedding. Yes, but then depending which one you pick for your downstream task, we'll call them embedding matrix. But both both learn something about each word, but they learn different things. And these algorithms utilizing them, you know, they use one or one or the other. What, what, what is different about what they learn? What they, what is different? What they learn? Well, they. They are in a different position of the of the of the network, so they have different kind of. Here you have the full context of all the words for predicting the next word, while here you have just basically the error of the so you know forward pass and error backpropagation pass. So they have different information, like essentially, what they learn is something different because it, it depends on the task and depending on all the all the other parts. They're not learning the same thing. But E uh, also takes the con context into account too. E takes the context into account through the propagation, right? Not it's it's just one word and looking out here, 
but it learns the error of the task and propagates back through the whole thing. And W, same, but it's just on a different place. Yeah. All right. OK. Yes, you have a question. I think we'll talk about it next time. It's fine. All right. OK, thank you.